It's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Justin Kolnick, who just released a while back uh, a continued education course that's getting rave reviews uh, called Lasers in the Management of the Apical Third of Root Canal Systems. 1977, Dr. Kolnick received his dental degree, cum laude, from the University of Waterstrand, South Africa, where he was awarded the gold medal of the South African Dental Association. He was the first graduate of the dental school to be awarded the prestigious university scholarship for overseas postgraduate study. In 1982, he graduated from the postdoctoral endodontic program at Columbia University in the city of New York. For the past 36 years, Dr. Kolnick has been in private practice limited endodontics in Westchester County, New York. His practice, Advanced Endodontics of Westchester, has four office locations and includes two partners and four associates and is de dedicated to fostering excellence in endodontics through education and the incorporation of the latest technology. In 2008, Advanced Endodontics of Westchester became the first laser-assisted endodontic practice in Westchester and in 2009 incorporated comb beam technology into all their offices. In 2011, Dr. Kolnick created the Endodontic Microsurgery Group dedicated to performing endodontic microsurgery in a unique state-of-the-art facility designed specifically for endodontic microsurgery and sedation. Dr. Kolnick has been committed to endodontic education, first as an associate clinical professor in endodontics at Columbia University, and then as an attending at Westchester Medical Center and associate clinical professor of endodontics at New York Medical College. Although he no longer holds these positions, he is currently a visiting lecturer in several graduate endodontic programs and continues to lecture extensively on a local, national, international level, and has published several articles on endodontics. For everyone listening who didn't watch your course on Dental Town, how did lasers work their way into endodontic therapy? Well, lasers uh, has been around for a while, but in uh, 2008, um, they developed the first radial or side-firing laser tips. And then that made the application in endodontics really more significant. So we've been involved with lasers for almost 10 years now, since 2008 or nine years now. And um, it's become a very important part of our practice. Because before the laser would just go straight out and it could go out the apex, but now the laser light comes down and makes a right-hand turn and goes to the side. Correct, correct. So a very small percentage of the laser light is emitted through the tip and about 90% uh, passes laterally to the walls of the canal. So how often, if you did 100 root canals, how, often, how many of them would you use a laser on? Everyone. Everyone. That's the, part of our standard protocol. So, you know, um, when, you, when you talk to dentists, uh, I, I've been a dentist 30 years this month, um, and you say, what percent of your root canals fail? They always say, well, knock on wood, you know, I've never even had one fail. And then you <laughs> see 4,000 endodontists. What, of the 4,000 endodontists in the United States, what percent of your practice is retreats? Probably 50 to 60 percent. Okay, so you must only be working on immigrants who had root canals in other countries and then moved to the United States? Pretty much, pretty much. Pr practice limited to immigrants who had a failed root canal done somewhere <laughs> else. Um, so so I, I love insurance data the most because it, it's so brutally huge samples. And there, the last study I saw from insurance is that if an endodontist does a first molar in five years, 5% 5 are extracted. If a general dentist does the first molar in five years, 10% um, are extracted. Why do you think... 5% of molars are extracted five years later after an endodontist does it, or 10% uh, five years later if a general dentist does it? Well, that's a very loaded question. I think a general, <laughs> a general dentist that's well-trained should be getting the same results as an endodontist that's well-trained. Um, the work is technically very difficult. The anatomy of the root canal system is very complicated, especially in molars. And uh, everything was going along pretty smoothly until the introduction of cone beam CT. And then when we started looking at endodontic treatment in three dimensions, we started to see uh, significant differences than looking at it in two-dimensional radiography. And um, there, was, uh, there are quite a few studies out now that show around 
anything from 30 to 40 percent of root canal therapy that looks good in two dimensions actually show signs of apical periodontitis in three dimensions. So the the results, um, depending on who's looking at them and what technology is being used to review these cases, the success rates can vary significantly. So the studies that were done by insurance companies are all two-dimensional studies. Yeah, that, that's why I love the, the, the study of just going with a simple extraction. Instead of someone deciding whether it failed or not, this was just a, right. well, what, what percent were actually e- extracted. Um, so when a, so would you say that the, the number one reason of a root canal failing is you didn't get it all cleaned out and the, the largest culprit would be a missed canal and then the second biggest reason would be that even though the canals you found, you didn't get it cleaned out well enough? Well, I think we need to uh, discuss this a little bit. The, the main reasons why endodontically treated teeth fail are more structural than endodontic. So vertical root fracture uh, is probably the most common cause of a root canal treated tooth uh, failing. If we look strictly at endodontic reasons for failure, uh, there are a whole host. It could be anything that contributes to not cleaning out the root canal system adequately. It could be root canals that were missed. It could be root canals that were um, ledged or... uh, the anatomy changed with the uh, the file system that's being used. So anything that that predisposed to leaving more bacteria in the root canal system could be responsible for an endodontic failure. But by far the the big push today, the big concern, is on preserving more tooth structure. And there are certain individuals that uh, more recently, guys like. Um, John Cardamy and David Clark and Gary Carr, these, these individuals have really started a movement for minimally invasive endodontics to preserve more tooth structure. And um, that's where the emphasis is right now. The problem with that, uh, with smaller access cavities, with smaller tapers on root canal systems, it gets even more difficult to clean the apical third of root canals. Uh, root canals. So um, that's where laser technology uh, for us is, has become very important because we are able to clean the apical third of root canal systems without having to open the, the root canals themselves to any great sizes. So so on these structural failures, do you, do you think the – 0.06 taper is just a little too much, not minimally invasive for, for the average molar. It depends where the taper is. If the taper is in the pericervical area, especially the coronal two-thirds of the root, then yes, it is too large. The um, There are some file systems that are 06 taper, but only in the apical three to four millimeters. And after that, it's reduced to either an 04 taper or 02 taper. So the idea is to try and clean the end of the root canal system while preserving dentin in the apical, in the coronal two thirds. So the 06 taper that extends the length of the file is too is too large. Yes. So so uh, this is dentistry uncensored. So feel free to throw anyone under a bus. So so what file system would you just say is too aggressive? Just your standard. 06 taper <laughs> file from the 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 06. Well, we we're seeing that the the companies uh, the, the one of the largest file companies would be Densply, Densply Serona, and they uh, they've made a concerted effort to come out with new file systems to re- replace those uh, pro taper systems that were um, considerably uh, you know larger the files the tapers. So I think all the companies are working towards. Are coming out with uh, more flexible files and um, lesser taper files. What um, they, they they always complain about name brands. I mean, dentists are all surgeons working in optory with their hands all day long. They they like names, brands, systems, and, they, and I know what they're thinking and they're listening. They they want to know what system you use. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, let's just back this up a little bit. I think I don't know the statistics, but I think that Densply uh, probably. Um, has the major share of the market, but I think the number two in line now is basically a no-name brand, which is called uh, Edgeendo. This is a, a file system that was uh, designed. Um, the company was started by by an endodontist, and they seem Al- to have kept in Albuquerque, captured, New Mexico, right? 
and they've captured a huge uh, percentage of the market and the files are significantly cheaper and um, so the, the, their popularity is really a testament to the company. If the files weren't working, then um, you know, endodontists wouldn't be buying the files. So what do you, what do you so, think the average uh, Densply file costs versus the Edge Endo? Uh, probably 50% more. For so uh, the Edge Endo files is probably around uh, $5 a file, say uh, $20 for four files, or it could be $28 for six files. And the other companies could be in the range of uh, $40 for six files. So, you, you know, know. I, I remember he, he was in a very long lawsuit with Densplay over the patents of these files, weren't, wasn't he? Uh, I'm not familiar with the, with, the, with the politics behind all of this. Yeah, there, But I, would, I wouldn't be surprised because, you know, there's so much going on in file design, in file material, whether it's uh, the type of wire, the nickel-titanium wire that's being used, and the patents on that, and the patents on design. Um, the patents on whether it's a 360-degree rotary or whether it's reciprocating. Um, so I'm really not privy to all that. Uh, so, I try not so, to pay too much attention to that. So you just opened up Pandora's box. What do you think about the difference between a full rotary versus um, back and well, forth? We, well, we use, I think both systems work. Uh, some of the studies show that more uh, dental mud or filings are pushed out of the system with a reciprocating type file. But I think um, I think both systems work. You know, you'll have uh, dentists who swear by, by each of them and uh, get good results. I don't think that the – I just – my philosophy on file systems is that the purpose of the file is simply to create a pathway – to the end of the root canal system that allows me to get my irrigation there. The studies show that um, a significant percentage of the root canal system is never touched by a file. So it could be uh, 30 to 40 percent of a root canal system is never touched by a file. So we all seem to agree that irrigation is the factor. But um, there are a whole lot of issues with irrigation because unless you get the uh, irrigating file to within one to two millimeters of your working length with a, um, a positive pressure side vented needle, the irrigant isn't getting to the end of the root canal. If there is accumulation of vapor, um, an apavapical vapical lock at the end of the root canal, an air bubble, the irrigant isn't getting to the end of the root canal. So. Sometimes uh, we see on the internet a dentist uh, will have a, a dental assistant who irrigates a canal for 30 minutes. It doesn't really matter how long you're irrigating for. If the irrigant isn't getting to the end of the root canal, it's not going to do its work. So um, there certainly are irrigating systems like apical negative pressure, uh, typically the endovac system, which actually sucks the solution down to the end, to, uh, end of the root canal system that has proven to be very effective, but it requires opening to slightly larger file sizes in the apical third. And certainly laser therapy, laser-activated irrigation has become a really big, um, a, a really a new finding in endodontics because we're able to activate, uh, whether it's plain water or whether it's sodium hypochlorite, we're able to activate it so that it permeates throughout the entire system. So what is this laser system that you're using? I use the erbium chromium YSGG laser. This is typically the uh, laser that's used by the Waterlays um, uh, BioLase company. Um, is that who makes it, water BioLase? Biolase makes the the um, the the waterlase system. Uh, another company is uh, the Pips. Everyone's heard of the Pips system, which utilizes uh, also an erbium, but an erbium YAG laser. Uh, and their protocol requires uh, that you only place the laser tip within the chamber of the root canal system, whereas the Biolase system requires that you uh, gives you the option to take the laser tip down within the root canal system. And but you're the saying the Pips system. Pips. Well, the bi the bilay system is not the PIP system. The bilay system is a different type of laser. It's, they're both erbium lasers. One is the erbium YSGG, and the other one is the erbium YAG. 
And the properties are very similar, the wavelengths are very similar, but the technique is very different. One uses water and the other one uses um, full-strength sodium hypochlorite. So the problem with using full-strength sodium hypochlorite and activating with, with a laser is that the solution goes everywhere. And unless you really got a tight seal around your rubber dam and you've corked it with a sealing, a sealant, uh, a sealing agent, the, it's very easy to get the solution into the patient's mouth. The other, the other, other situation with the, with the lasers is that it will push the solution out the end of the root canal. So if you're pushing water out the end of the root canal or if you're pushing um, sodium hypochlorite out the end of the canal, it makes a big difference. So the system that I, I've been using for the, for the last uh, almost 10 years is the BioLay system. And just to let everyone know, I am a um, clinical instructor for BioLays. I do train the uh, endodontists who buy that system, um, but I'm not employed by the company. But it's uh, do, you, do you train general dentists on it, or just endodontists? Well, the I, I pretty much just do the advanced training for endodontists. Does Gary Carr does he ever teach general dentists, or is he still only teaching endodontists? Well, Gary Carr, uh, his teaching reaches everyone because he has. Um, you know, he's made many instructional videos that I've access to, to everyone. I don't know if he's doing any formal teaching. Um, we just came back from the American Association of Endodontists meeting last week in New Orleans, where I did uh, uh, two presentations and a workshop. I know Gary did um, at least uh, two, two or three presentations. And, um, you know, Gary is in, the, in a league of his own. He's certainly the father, one of the fathers of of modern day endodontics, he he introduced um, first of all the ultrasonic tips for us. He introduced um, the microscopes, but more importantly, he taught us how to uh, the ergonomics of endodontics, uh, and most important, he taught us how to think for ourselves. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, questioning going on now in endodontics. We're questioning the literature. We're questioning old um, techniques, old ideas, and um, I think it's a very healthy thing. So was uh, was Ben Johnson there, the founder of Tulsa Dental Products? I didn't see Ben. I'm sure he may have been. I didn't see him there. I don't know if he was. Uh, I didn't see him lecturing, but. Um, you know, certainly he he's uh, he's one of the top guys. He certainly has uh, made his mark in endodontics. Can, can I tell you a uh, a funny story of how I perceive the difference between Ben Johnson and Gary Carr? Uh huh. <laughs> Back in the day, I wouldn't have learned from Gary Carr, but he'd only let endodontists in there, so I just thought, well, you know, I'm Catholic, a uh, saying I'm an endodontist. That's only a venial sin. I mean, it's not a mortal sin. So I went down there and just. Uh, went down there with uh, Mike Totola, and we were sitting in the class, and it was just loving it. But yeah. he found out about 20 minutes before the end of the class that I was a general dentist, and I got a scolding in my lifetime. But yeah. Ben Johnson, on the other hand, I called him up, and I'm in, I'm in Phoenix. I called him in Tulsa, and I had all these questions. And he said, you know what, dude? He said, you should just fly down here on Southwest Airlines and only cost you 200 bucks and spend the day with me. And he let right. me go down there and spend the day with them and then go to his house. Another one that was like that was that John McSpadden in Chattanooga. Yes. I called him up and he says, you know, he says, you have way, way, way too many questions. Why don't you just jump on a plane? And I said, well, well what's a close hotel to your office? Right. He said, my uh -huh. house. He said, my house. <laughs> he picked me up at the airport. Well, it's, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are many, there are many people who have contributed in that way. I mean, some have set up teaching institutions, um, you know, like uh, Steve Buchanan, for example, um, uh, a, a lot of a lot of the people that are teaching also um, have got a financial interest in the products that they're talking about. So I think that both general dentists and specialists just need to be aware of you know full disclosure from everyone because if they're pushing a certain file and it's a file that they have a financial interest in, then it certainly um, clouds the situation a little bit. I mean, yeah. Gary, uh, Gary Carr has, has been above all of that. He really, really, um, you know, he really hasn't um, got um, involved with the um, 
you know, the endorsement of, of products that he gets financial um, um, reward from. Although he does have his own company, uh, they do sell tips. Uh, you know, I think everyone has an agenda. Uh, I have an agenda. You may have an agenda. Well, Everyone I, has an agenda, but I think that transparency transparency is the number one thing. And um, uh, you know, you, you're putting me on the spot here. I know all these gentlemen, and well, uh, I have high well, uh, regard for all of them. And uh, and you know, Gary certainly is one of my mentors. Um, he has his office has been open. His home has been open. To um, to students and dentists alike, he has this uh, TDO organization and uh, the software that he's produced, and there are literally thousands of people that are um, learning from him all the time. So I guess he had to draw the line somewhere um, in terms of bringing people into his uh, facility or his office. Is he still racing horses? I don't know. Well, you know, uh, when we started Dental Town in 98, a lot of dentists did not want any dental manufacturers on there. And I said, dude, if you took away 500 dental companies, we're sitting outside on a rug with a bunch of stuff from Home Depot. And if all the users of this stuff are saying they wished it was red and it was blue, don't the manufacturers need to know this? I mean, and then the dentists would say, well, they're selling something for a profit. I'm like, oh, so you, what are you, a volunteer and a public health dentist? Pretty sure you're making six figures income. Um, selling root canals and crowns. So I, I think the only key to that stuff is uh, as long as it's all transparent. I lost you. Be... I got you back. I got you back. I lost I lost you the audio, yeah. but I'm back. Okay. Yeah, that's... Yeah. As, long, as long as they're – I mean, everybody has an agenda. I mean, a dentist has an agenda to sell dentistry, and so why? what's wrong with a dental manufacturing company um, selling their supplies? I, I think the most functional relationship is actually Europe. Americans, when you go to the um, – the Cologne meeting every two years, the CEOs of the company and their scientists are in the booth and they, they do all the communication directly and there's no dental lectures. And then you come to the United States and those people are like taboo because they're selling stuff, they're off in their booths. Then, then you go to some middleman who's talking about all these different systems and I, I think the Europeans just have a much more trusting relationship between the dentists and the dental manufacturers as experienced at the Cologne meeting and Americans just, by and large, are extremely cynical people. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that's your experience. Um, I think that it's all – everything's global now. I, I, it's hard to even differentiate between, you know, uh, American dentists or European dentists. At the AAE meeting recently, there was a huge contingent from overseas all over the world. And um, – I would like to see eradic, you know, separation between commercialization and and the specialties, but I think that's a thing of the past. I don't think we can afford to put on these big conventions without the financial help from these uh, from these companies. And the convention attendance across the board is going down. It's been declining for decades as people move to like your online C course on Dental Town, or right, right. YouTube, or the, the, this podcast. This may have been the biggest attendance ever for an endodontic meeting. I know that I'm lecturing at the Greater New York at the end of the year, and they're expecting, I think, uh, for 55 to 60,000 uh, attendees. Uh, I think that um, some meetings are still very, very strong, and uh, and then of course you have the online. The uh, education online is uh, is is huge today, especially the CE credits and. Uh, um, it's much easier to listen to some very knowledgeable people online than have to travel halfway across the world to listen to them. So, yeah, I think Dental Town is, a, is an absolute example of that, sure. So there's been a lot of changes in sealers. Well, I mean, I, I started out with Grossman Cement. Do they even sell yeah. that anymore? <laughs> can you buy a bottle of they Grossman do. Cement? You can, you can buy the um, – some of the sealers today are based on, on, the, on those uh, – on those sealers, you can still get them. Um, the big push today seems to be towards the um, the calcium silicates, the bioceramic sealers, which um, are showing real promising uh, promising uh, results. Um, you know, they are bioactive materials, and they continue to be bioactive until they set within the root canal system. 
And they pretty much um, don't um, shrink on setting, which is a big problem with the previous sealers. That's why we needed to keep them as thin as possible and keep the gutta percha as wide as possible within the root canal system. So now there is a trend towards relying more on the sealer and less on the gutta percha. So the single cone gutta percha technique with the bioceramic sealer is gaining a lot of popularity right now. What sealer are you using? I'm using a bioceramic sealer uh, made by Brassler. Um, that that that's the one. That's the bioceramic sealer that's getting the most buzz, isn't it? Yeah, but there's a lot of competition coming out now. Um, there are actually uh, sealers uh, that have MTA uh, mineral trioxide aggregate in them now that are proving to be um, very popular. The problem is with the cost. Uh, the sealers are very expensive, um, and I think that as competition grows, the price will come down. But there, there could be maybe five or six at least on the market right now that probably are just uh, equivalent in terms of their um, of their, their capabilities within root canal systems. I never understood why that um, that MTA cement costs more per gram than heroin when it was just <laughs> swimming pool cement. I mean, that, that that's all it was, right? Portland, Portland cement, yeah. Portland, Portland cement. cement. I mean, how, how right. come I can buy a gallon of it for my swimming pool, but it, but when I buy a gram of it in dentistry, I mean, it's like it's some a diamond in the rough. Wasn't that kind of yeah. funny? Uh, yeah, it was funny and it was sad. I mean, certainly very expensive. Uh, there are alternatives now, uh, so there is competition. There are cheaper products available, but still, uh, you only need a small amount of it and. Uh, you know, the packaging has improved. It's not so so much in one sachet anymore. You can, you know, you can get smaller amounts so that uh, you don't have to waste. The wastage has been reduced. But I think bioceramics right now in terms of sealers, uh, the bioactive sealers um, seem to be the, uh, the, uh, the big push right now. So... Um how many of these uh, bio lace, water lace do you own them? Because you have uh, what, four, four. You have how many endodontists are in your four locations? Total? Well, I, I need I need to just clarify that a little bit. We are currently going through a merger with uh, an, another endodontic office is merging with us. So until the mergers, when when the mergers complete, there will be um, seven endodontists in four locations. So so you have one. Bio lace, water lace in each location. Then we have a total of um, seven. Seven bio lace. Yeah, seven. Uh, seven of the all tissue lasers. Yeah. And and how much? Uh, so, so for someone listening to this and sa and says, well, I I want to get into laser um, cleaning of the apical third of the root canal system. Mm -hmm. I think they should take your C course on Dental Town. How much is this bio lace water lace um, unit? Well, they've they've just come out with the um, smallest and least least expensive all tissue laser on the market. I I believe it's going for um, just under forty, something like that, maybe forty thousand. The uh, the bigger machines and most of the companies are around about anything from sixty to seventy thousand. So the price is the price is almost half now of what it was before. Uh, certainly coming down and um, more compact. Um, it's just been released actually. I I just received mine um, just a couple of weeks ago. What's the exact name of it? It's called the uh, Express. The BioLace so bio Water Lace Express. Yeah, BioLace is the company. I guess Water Lace is the technology, and Express is the is the unit. And and it's uh small. How, how portable? How small and portable is it? It's about twenty five pounds. You can you can. There's a handle. You can lift it up and and uh, and uh, and move it around. The limitation of this particular laser is that it's not designed to cut teeth. So if you want to do cavity preparations, uh, this is not the laser for you because the, there's insufficient power. But for all the endo applications, for the um, perio applications, periodontitis, implantitis, uh, soft tissue, um, uh, it's all, it's all um, compatible with this new machine. It's a, it's a four-watt machine. And the I-plus, which is their 
high-end machine is a 10-watt machine. So it'll, it will cut uh, enamel more effectively than the smaller machine. So what, what's, the, what's the bigger 10-watt one called? The I+. Plus. The I+. Plus. I wonder what the I stands for. <laughs> Everything. I don't know. I, intelligent. I, I don't know. I+. Plus. I, iPhone. Well, the iPhone, the I iPhone. is for internet, isn't it? Innovation. I don't know. I don't know exactly. So, so yeah. So, um, so you're saying the Water Lace Express would be great for an endodontist for cleaning the apical yeah. third. And for a periodontist, that's the LINAP procedure, right? Well, that's a different – LINAP is a different company. What company is that? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. It's not my field. Um, but it's the Erbium, uh, Erbium YAG. It's, a, it's a, also an Erbium or tissue laser, but it is um, the YAG as opposed to the YSGG. I'm not sure of the of the company. Maybe uh, Mille- you can Millennium see Millennium Dental. LINAP is Millennial. There you go. Millennial. Millennium. Right, right. But the I think the protocol for for biolays for the uh, the periodontal protocol is called the repair repair protocol. So so their LANAP protocol is called the repair protocol. No, no, no. The, the the biolays protocol is the repair is the repair protocol, and the Millennium protocol is the LANAP procedure. I'm not familiar with uh, with the LANAP procedure. I'm a little bit more familiar with the uh, repair because it's the same machine that I use, but I really don't, uh, for the most part, I don't treat periodontal disease. So um, someone else would probably be a little bit more of an expert to speak on that than me. So um, there's another famous endodontist in your backyard. You're, you're in Manhattan, right? One of your locations? I'm just, just, no, just north of Manhattan in Westchester County. Um, Barry, um, oh my God, who's the guy with the, um, the, uh, Barry Musicant. Uh, right. he, he's always talking about files breaking and he likes his, uh, file because, uh, he thinks it breaks much less. Um, yeah. do you think file breakage is a big problem? Do you think Barry Musicant's uh, onto something with that? Um, well, let me find some wood to touch. We, we don't break files anymore. So I think file breakage really is not the problem that it was before. Um, he uses the, he created the safe cider file. Um, I'm not too familiar with it. I believe it's also a reciprocating uh, file, and um, he's had a lot of success with it. Um, but I think I think that a lot of times the manufacturers um, play on the. Uh, they, they they emphasize the breakage of files, and this puts everyone into a panic. But really, we unless you abuse the uh, the file that you're using, most files today, and and it's a, it's a new file, you're not using it 50 times. If it's uh, most of them are supposed to be single use, um, you should not be in a situation where you break files. You know, we um, my 30 year um, I graduated 30 years ago, May 11, and last week. Uh, um, you know, they had a big party for uh, at the uh, UMKC alumni meeting. But a lot of the a lot of the um, dentists were talking about, and particularly one of the endodontists in our class, talking about that when we were in school 30 years ago, four classes of 120 had six endodontists in the endo department, and some of these private schools have one. Um, and so a lot of people, a lot of endodontists, are telling me that. Some of these kids are coming out of school where there was only where the faculty, you know, it's so uh, so small that they don't even know basic endo. Do do you see that anywhere, or do you not see that? Well, you know, the the schools that I'm involved with, and I've lectured uh, probably in about a dozen programs around the country. I think that they um, that uh, it's not it's, it's not really a problem. I think the I don't think that general dentists that are finishing their program uh, have sufficient training. So I don't know whether some schools are pushing a lot of the more complicated uh, work off to the uh, postdoctoral program so that the undergrads aren't getting much exposure. Um, Some of the requirements are ridiculously small. It may be, you know, uh, five teeth, one molar, bicuspid, a few centrals, and then they're done. So, um, once again, edu- the, that type of education isn't my thing. Uh, I'm more of a visiting lecturer. 
but um, I, I've been involved with Columbia University with uh, Freddie Barnett's program uh, at Einstein, uh, USC I've been at, I've been at UConn. Um, the programs that, that are around here, I think, uh, have got good staff. Um, you know, I, I think there's always work that has to be done to to get the programs better. But you know, I'm not an educator. I have to t I have to tip my hat to those endodontists that are full time educators. I think that we we don't have enough of them. I don't think that the 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 money is there, and I think that you know most of these um, teaching spots are taken by foreigners who either aren't licensed to work here or who are really dedicated uh, to teaching. So. You know, I really have to tip my hat to these to these individuals. I want you to. I want to change subjects completely and go to something totally different. Um, the natural selection of a dentist. I mean, in order to get into med school, dental school, or, or law school, you had, you had to get A's. And so, dentists were the boring people sitting in the library every night, as opposed to business people who were in frats and drinking and had girlfriends and all that stuff. So you have this very shy introvert scientist who does surgery with her hands all day. And you have to be a great salesman to sell cosmetics and veneers and all this stuff. But a toothache, you don't have to sell. I mean, they come in and they say, gosh, I'm in pain. Dr. Kolnick, can you help me? But she comes out of school and she says, I'm $350,000 student loans. The insurance pays 80% of this molar root canal, but I hate molar endo. I don't want to do it. But she knows she needs to change that attitude because she's got to pay off $350,000 student loans. You can't, you can't, can't. Absolutely. And, and she might be in a rural area where if you say, well, you got to drive an hour into Flagstaff, she says, forget it, just pull it. What would you say to a 25-year-old kid who came out of school and says, I hate endo. I hate it. Well, if you hate it, don't do it. I mean, but if you need to do it, you get get trained. I mean, there certainly are plenty programs, uh, continue education programs, whether they're on the internet. Uh, you have to keep studying. I mean, when I trained, there was there were no microscopes, there were no rotary files, there was no nickel titanium. There was, you know, everything along the way we had to teach ourselves, and then we became the teachers. So if it's uh, something like lasers where I decided to make the investment and the commitment uh, nine, ten years ago. I'm, I'm the one, one of the, one of the few that are doing the teaching right now. So it's continued education. You've just got to be committed to improving yourself. Um, there are institutes all over the country. There are uh, many of the mentors that we discussed earlier. These are, are the people that are doing the educating. You have to, you have to, you have to keep learning. Uh, An another, you know. another problem this twenty-five-year-old has: he's working in a group Please. practice, um, or there's different specialists, and the oral surgeons that the, she sees a failed root canal, and the oral surgeons are, you know, someone already tried it once. Let's pull that thing out and go to titanium, and then it ended on a saying, "No, no, no, you should retreat." And she's like, "What? What are you thinking when you see a failed root canal? What? What? What?" What are you focusing on the most that makes you go towards retreatment versus titanium? Long-term prognosis. So what, what we're looking at is, you know, we want to win the battle and we want to win the war. We want what we do to be um, treated well, to be restored properly, and to be in the patient's mouth 15, 20 years from now. So if a tooth, um, we, can, we can pretty much treat anything, but if it's not restorable, if the, uh, you know, there's an inadequate ferrule, um, we really have to take all the restorative, um, the restorative situation into, into account. I think sometimes uh, endodontists or dentists may undertake to treat something that really has a really poor prognosis in terms of, you know, five to ten years uh, so I think I think the, the big thing I would look at would be um, long-term prognosis the other thing is um, to do no harm you got to make sure that you're going to be helping the patient there is quite a big discussion today especially with the advent of cone beam CT about these radiographic findings that we are seeing at the end of, of root canal systems 
um, you know, many of them today are not being treated, even by specialists. Uh, the um, patient may come in with a small periapical radiolucency that's been there for 30 years, and um, the tooth is restored, no work is planned on the tooth, and, you know, it's a really calcified situation, um, or there may be a large post in there, and you have an eager dentist, an endodontist may go in to redo it because he sees that very small finding at the end of the root canal, and he may end up destroying the tooth in the process. So, and the patient certainly is less, less well off afterwards than if the tooth were just left alone. So uh, there, there is quite a trend now in, in endodontics to be more conservative with our thinking and to be uh, more long-term with our thinking in terms of long-term success. Um, and really, the, the outcomes really are patient-orientated uh, outcomes. Um, what we, you know, we, we often do a lot of things for ourselves. We want to see a lateral canal on an x-ray, or we want to pat ourselves on the back for doing a really good root canal. But ultimately, it's the patient. It's the patient that needs to be happy with the tooth, uh, if we do a beautiful root canal and the patient still has pain in the tooth, um, it doesn't help. It doesn't help the patient. So it really has to be patient-centered. Our our treatment planning, our considerations, and uh, we move forward from there. You know, um, it's interesting talking to ENTs in the valley, where they say that someone will claim they have had allergies for ten years, and they go in there and they find failing root canals. And they're, they're saying that, um, or, or even failing sinus lifts. And uh, they're, they're, they, they say this problem, they don't know, it seems to be getting larger. More. Well, there's certainly, it's, it's surprisingly how, how high the percentage, the, the percentage of patients suffering with chronic sinusitis, chronic maxillary sinusitis that have a dental component is quite high. How high I would mean, you it's, think it is? There's some studies that can go as high as 40%. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to get him to build a course on it and do a podcast with me. And some of it he says is crazy. Like, you'll go up there and there'll be, like, white candidiasis infection, you know, all, all around the sinus. And and um, I, so I want to ask you an emotional question. You, There's no right or wrong. <laughs> Here's an emotional question. It seems like dentists go to the church of odontology, and there's a missing first molar. So since they worship teeth, they just blow a hole in the sinus and pack it with cow bone and titanium, all that stuff. But then when I go talk to the ENTs, the rhinologists, the, uh, uh, how you say it, otar, laryngeologist, um, they're like, hey, doc, stay out of my place. Stay out of that damn sinus. You had two teeth there. They've been doing bridges since the Egyptians 3,000 years ago. Leave my sinus alone. Uh, we're, we're, and then I know you're jaded because... You're an endodontist. Uh, you're, you know, you 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 come from the Church of Odontology. But do you do you think that dentists are too biased against bridges and too quick to go in and do a sinus graft? Well, I get the feeling that they are too quick to pull the plug on the tooth. So I, I think ultimately um, saving the tooth would be the best solution to this problem that you've presented. Um, you know, from my experience with doing surgery in and around the sinus, the, the sinus is quite a resilient area. I think the sinus heals rapidly and it does well, provided you, um, you know, you keep infection out. So I, I, got, I got to imagine that with all the sinus lifts and implants that are being done right now, that, um, that I think the prognosis is good, you know, if it's well done. I think it's uh, there's no real problem with doing a sinus lift and 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 uh, you know placing a graft in the area, but once again, it needs to be done properly. Um, change the subject. Um, back to uh, endo failures. What percent of failed molar endos are do you think from a leaking crown? <laughs> you know there are studies, and I I, I just don't have the. Uh, I don't have the statistics uh, on my fingertips. But how many I years have you been ended honest? 35 years. So in 35 years, what would your intuition be? What would your gut tell you? Well, there's certainly a big trend in endodontics today to, um, to 
provide some of the restoration of the endodontically treated tooth. We have the tooth under the rubber dam. We are working under high magnification. We can see if the system is caries free, is clean. And a lot of uh, a lot of people believe that uh, it is the endodontist that should be building the core or placing the post um, while the tooth is um, under uh, you know aseptic uh, under aseptic conditions. Um, there's no doubt about it that um, restorative failure is one of the leading causes of reinfection of root canal, of root canal systems. So it's significant. I don't it, know it, what exactly. The when, when I feel sorry for endodontists and labs because, you know, if if a dentist sends a crown brag and says it doesn't fit, remake it, and the lab man's like, okay, dude, you only see your impressions. I see ten big dentists doing crowns all day, and you have the worst preps and the worst impressions. But they 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 live in fear that if they say something, they're going to lose the five thousand dollar a month account. So if you're out there listening and you, and uh, um, you need to call your lab man, the only way you're going to be a better dentist is to call your lab man and say, "Dude, look, I, I I'm hungry, I'm humble, I'm not an arrogant doctor lawyer, I'm not like that, and if I can be a better uh, dentist, please help me." And they need to do the the same with the endodontist because some of these endodontists they'll say they'll re the general dentist will refer the root canal to you. But he says, but I want to do the post and buildup because that mental midget is only thinking about billing out the post buildup. And and the re and the saliva, which has a billion bacteria, fungi, and virus per mm -hmm. cc. I mean that that's insane. But the point I was making is uh I when whenever a root canal failed, um, you know, a root I, I see a failed root canal building crown. I never did the retreat through the crown because I'm like, I, I don't, I don't even know what's under this thing. And, and I always take off the crown because I wanted to see, you know, I have to get all the decay out first. I had to get the furrow right. out. I need, sometimes they needed, um, 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 perio, uh, gum, gum, crown lengthening th therapy, sure, uh, sure. yourself or a periodontist, whatever. And I just see. I just think, what well, what percent of the vast majority of retreats do you think they go through the existing crown? And do you really think that's a good idea? I mean, I the only reason anybody would want to keep the crown is because they don't want to pay the lab bill of making a new crown. But if hell, if you have CAD CAM and CIRAC, now now we're down to the price of a block. Um, right. What, what what do you what do you think about do, doing retreats? I think I crown? think go, going through older crowns is definitely a problem. Uh, the, you know, we see a lot of cases where the crown is uh, is actually quite new on the tooth. You know, these new bonded crowns, the seal is excellent. There's no um, sign of decay, and there's there's nothing wrong with going through the crown to do the root canal therapy. But uh, very often we'll go through the crown and we'll see caries and we'll see that it's compromised. The crown has to come off. Um, you know, I think a very high percentage of older crowns are leaking. A very high percentage. So and, how old would that crown have to be before you said, I'm, I'm taking it off? I, I, and plus, when when I take off the crown, I just feel like I can do so much better endo because you, you can see everything as opposed to trying to do it looking through some BB hole. Well, we also like to have the crown off because we want to preserve tooth structure. So when you go through a crown, the, the you don't know what the original anatomy of the tooth was. And you don't know where the core of the of the tooth uh, structure is, so you often end up making an access cavity that's much much larger than it should be. You end up destroying tooth structure. Um, but you know, in situations like bridges, you can take a whole bridge off if it's an abutment. Uh, but a surprising number of cases we treat are teeth that have had crowns placed within six months. Okay, so that leads to my next question, which is a biology. That was a perfect segue for my next question. Um, you're doing, uh, you're, you're removing the decay. You remove the MOD amalgam. You're removing the decay, and you got a little bitty pulp exposure. Which do you think is more predictable to seal, the pulp exposure, or to do the whole endodontic therapy and seal the apex at the very bottom? Which which one's more predictable to seal? Would you? Would you? I think. I think if the if the root is uh, immature, if it's a child and the root is immature, I think vital pulp therapy is 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 in order to try and preserve the um, the root canal, the pulp tissue, so that the root can develop normally. 
So certainly the um, pulp, pulp caps, pulpotomies generally are done more in, uh, in permanent teeth that are still developing. Um, in, in, a, in adult teeth where the uh, root canals have – the roots are fully formed, the, um, a, a, a traumatic pulp exposure uh, or created by a burr, not a carious pulp exposure, may respond quite well to a, um, to a pulp cap. Um, you know, I don't have the statistics on that, but I think that um, – I think if it's not a curious pulp exposure and and the root system is fully developed um, and it's a small exposure, certainly you could do a um, a pulp cap. Uh, it'll work very well. There is even a trend in certain circles now not to remove all the decay in in a tooth that um, that has a deep decay, uh, and there have been some surprising results showing that. Uh, Teeth have actually done well when some of that stained or hard dentin is uh, is left behind and not removed. Yeah. Uh, yeah good, some luck people are, good luck explaining that to a jury why you left decay. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, you know, I, I certainly come from the school where, um, uh, you know, a pulp, pulp is exposed, certainly a carious pulp exposure, we would do the full root canal therapy. Yeah. I, uh, um, if you were going to do a pulp cap, how, what would you, what would you do? Would you use MTA? Would you, how, what would you do it with? First of all, we would use, uh, the, the, the protocol we use in our office is with a laser. So this is a laser protocol to do a pulp cap or to do a, a partial pulpotomy or, or the so-called svec pulpotomy or a full pulpotomy. Uh, the most atraumatic way to do it is with a laser. With the uh, the water lays uh, that that we use, uh, it's 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 very effective. Um, but basically, um, the bioceramics, the bioceramics are the materials for that. You know, um, noble calcium you... hydroxide. It uh, was MTA, the white MTA or the gray MTA. But we see more staining of the teeth with that. Uh, what about the going down here? What, what, what about just going down to your, your uh, swimming pool store in Phoenix, Arizona, and buying just a bucket of Portland cement? Well, that's not medical grade. <laughs> <laughs> it's not medical grade. But the, 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 there are quite a few materials, biodentin, by the, uh, you know, there's uh, the BC putty. There, there, there are a lot of products on the market today that um, are um, actually stimulate the um, – either cementum if it's at the end of the root canal or a dentin-like material to bridge these, um, you know, these, uh, these pulp exposures or pulpotomies. And uh, it's been very successful. So you, you said you've been doing, seeing a lot of um, teeth that need endo that were just recently crowned. Yes. What, what, what do you think, what, what mistakes are, or what causes do you think are the most common Iatro do you think it's iatrogenic reasons? Why, why, well, the, why do you think you're seeing a lot of new crowns that need a root canal? I think one of the most common reasons for the situation are cracked teeth. Because a dentist, often there will be a, a crack in the tooth and maybe the uh, a cusp breaks away and the dentist looks at it and thinks, well, that's it, you know, the, uh, the, the crack is no longer there, the broken piece of tooth is gone, but yet we can see often that the crack does extend deeper into the tooth. Uh, a lot of, a lot of the, the, I, I think the crack tooth syndrome is probably an epidemic condition that we see today. Um, the, uh, the occlusal stresses, the clenching, grinding, everything that contributes to it. Um, you know, I'm not a restorer of dentist, but I think I'll probably in the New York metropolitan area or any big metropolitan area, Probably anyone over the age of 35 should be wearing an occlusal guard or, uh, 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 you know, a mouth guard at night because of all the clenching and grinding that's going well, on. Well, maybe so, they should just leave Manhattan and go live out in the country. <laughs> maybe they'd stop grinding their teeth if they moved upstate New York. It could be. I don't know. Maybe it's the uh, political political well, you know, situation that's uh, that's causing people to clench and clench and grind a little more. Man, but, these are crazy um, times, aren't they? These are, these are crazy times. So I think that the the biggest complaint we have when a crown is placed on a tooth that 
Um, looks like it's quite normal to accept the crown. No, you know, deep excavation, no pulp exposure, and yet the patient complains of, um, you know, uh, acute temperature sensitivity or biting on hard objects. And you test it with a tooth sleuth, and you see there's pain on release of biting. These are char characteristic of crack tooth syndrome. So I would say that probably the majority of cases that we end up treating after new crowns are placed are from a palpitus, usually from a, an internal crack in the tooth. You know, try, try, l l let's say, I only got you for five more minutes. L let's stay on that then, because this is a big thing. Because they, they ask a lot on Dental Town, they'll take a picture, they remove the MOD amalgam, and there's a black line on the floor underneath it. And they're like, you know, help. You know, what, how, how do you analyze cracks? You take out it's the MOD, problem. you take out the decay, or it's a, talk, talk about, talk, just, just rant for another four and a half minutes on cracks. Sure. That's a really big problem for us because um, typically if, if a crack causes the tooth to become, become non-vital or the pulp to become infected, it's usually not a good sign for the tooth. So if we evaluate a crack and we open up into the chamber and we see that the crack runs through the floor of the chamber or if the crack runs down a root canal – below the, the level of the CEJ, these are all very poor uh, prognosis uh, situations. Um, but we can't, um, ex we can't extract every tooth that comes in with a crack because we see so many of them. So the teeth typically that we treat are teeth that are vital. Uh, when we transilluminate these teeth, the, um, the blockage of the, of the transmitted light usually isn't total. It's partial. Um, or the oblique fractures that undermine the cusp as opposed to running through the center of the pulp chamber have a better prognosis. But any time there is a pocket associated with a crack or there is a um, focal or periapical lesion associated with a cracked tooth, then the tooth really needs to come out. And one last uh, deal. Um, were you born in South Africa? I was born in South Africa, yes. What is it with so many of the world's greatest endodontists coming out of South Africa? Uh, it just must be the accent, I think. It's the accent. I mean, it, it's, got, <laughs> it's got a hell of a legacy. I mean, it'd be like, uh, I mean, don't you agree? We had a really good training. Um, in South Africa, you don't go to college first. You go six years into dental school. So here it's four years college, four years dental school. So we get an actually two years extra training in dental school, but we don't have the liberal arts uh, education that many of the uh, American dentists have. So, so, so you're I, able to do endodontics without taking all those courses in sociology, anthropology, and political science? We are. We are. <laughs> and the other thing is we don't have the specialists there, so we had to do it ourselves. We had to be trained, and we had to do it ourselves. Who do you stay in touch with that's uh, endodontist from South Africa today? Any? Who? Uh, Dr. Marty Trope. Martin Trope. Amazing man. Um, I'm not sure really off the top of my mind. There are a whole bunch that I don't think that you'll, you'll know, but I think, you know, Marty Trope, do you, do you recall any names? Uh, well, Mar you and Martin, I mean, you, uh, Martin has an online C course on dental town too. And I mean, uh, right. um, and I, I've lectured in Johannesburg and Soweto. And I mean, I, I, that, that, that's an amazing country, 50 million people. I mean, it's, uh, pro probably the wealthiest country in South Africa and in, in, in all of Africa, wouldn't you say? It, w it was. It was. The, the money seems to have disappeared. So, uh, you know, I think Africa is, uh, is a continent unto itself. The way governments run in Africa are a little different from the way governments run in the Western world. And, um, you know, South Africa is a country that's, uh, that's been reborn. And it's going to take probably, um, you know, a good two, three, four generations for that country to to uh, evolve the way it should. And I think it's, it's on its way. Um, uh, it's, uh, as I said, I've, I've lived in America longer than I've lived in South Africa, but I go back every year. My family's there. I go back to lecture every year. And um, I think it'll find its way. It'll find its way. And it's certainly one of the most beautiful countries in the world. Oh, yeah. Every time I go there, I take at least two or three of my four boys with me. Oh, oh, yeah. We, we just love it. Last question. I get you for 45 yes. seconds. I love insurance data. Can you explain to me why over the last 30 years 
the number of apicoactomy and retrofills has just been trending down. It, it's almost like it's an animal that's going to go extinct. Uh, well, why... the, the, the two reasons. One, because the way that the surgery was being done was uh, had a very poor prognosis. Um, second of all, the teeth are being removed and implanted. But a, a tooth that is uh, indicated for apical surgery should have the same success rate as a retreatment. So when are you doing apicolectomy retrofills? What, what's this, what, 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 what tooth condition are you looking at um, when you're doing your apicolectomy retrofills? Is it just a, a well, file some, you can't get out? Is it a, what, what, what's going on in the tooth? It's persistent infection. And we have to decide whether the best approach is through the root canal or whether it's surgical. If going through the root canal system is going to weaken the tooth uh, excessively or if the, the system is blocked and there's no way down to the end of the root canal system, then we will resort to the apical surgery. Apical surgery in many cases is the most conservative approach because it preserves more tooth structure than going in through a crown, taking a post out, especially in a bicuspid, in a weak tooth. And once again, you may win the battle but lose the war because we're looking for long-term success uh, for these teeth. And long-term, we're talking about 10, 15, 20 years. I love that saying. I've never heard it before. You may win the battle but lose the war. That's saying. I just love that. Is that a South African saying? Must be. It must be. Yeah, I, I've must not heard be. that one before. But hey, I just want to tell you, I can't believe a guy like you uh, gave me an hour. I mean, you gave us an online C course that uh, everyone loves. And I know you're a busy ended on us with four locations. I just want to tell you, thank you so much for spending an hour today with me and all my homies. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. All right. Well, you have a great day.